Reading from the uh, New Living Translation, John 3.16. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And then from Luke, they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherds' story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. And then in 1 John, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. It's okay. You can come in. He won't bite. He's just a small baby. A little shy? <laughs> That's okay. I am too. Your friends left in such a rush to go tell the world. I think that's how they put it. And what a thing to tell. Did you know an angel visited me too? It's true. And he said that my boy would be great. The son of God. He said that he would be the king of angels, the king of all. Do you think that they'll understand? Do you think that they'll come to worship him? Will they accept him? Let's just look around us. It's not exactly a palace, is it? Noisy animals. Hey, out of all things for a bed. And that stench for everything that he is. Maybe this isn't enough. I find myself just watching. adorned him. I thought I knew what love was. Until he came along. My mother gave this blanket to me when I was just a little girl. A gift of love. I wore it out. When we were preparing for the trip to Bethlehem, I told Joseph I wanted to bring it. No, he said. We must pack light. I brought it anyway. The baby needs a blanket. Yes, they will come. The faithful. How could they not? He was born the king of angels. He will be great and mighty. He is all this and more. But when you go tell my young friend, be sure, be sure to tell them that he is an incredible gift of love.
Thanks, Jim. That song, that song, um, we usually sing it so slow and calm. But when we think about the words to that song, that song is a compelling action song. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Thanks again, Jim. Um, I want to say first, before we do that, two things really quickly. One, uh, if you are so inclined and are willing, the Salvation Army in Wyerton is really short of people who will work at their kettle. And so they're looking for people who will volunteer even just once to do that for just two hours. Um, and so they called this week, and I said I certainly would ask. So if you're interested in that, uh, contact the Salvation Army in Wyerton, and uh, maybe that's something that, that we can help them out with. The second thing is, if you're in the room here and you're in grade 9 or 10 or younger, um, uh, and you take notes while I'm talking for the next half hour or so, I don't have any Skittles here. But what I do have in the meantime is Christmas Rice Krispie Squares. So if, if that applies to you and you take notes, come and show them to me later and, and we'll hook you up. All right. If I came, if we were meeting like this and there's, there's 200 people in the room and I came running in the back doors yelling, get out here, you got to see this. This is amazing. Come out here and look. Depending on my excitement level, my guess is two or three of you would come out. Not because it's me, just because, when does this happen in our world? Someone sees something that's so amazing that they are over the top excited and they're grabbing you by the arm and pulling you to come and see it. Well, folks, that's this song that, just, that Jim just rang, sang. That, that's, this, that's saying, hey, come here quick. Check this out. This is incredible. I'm so happy. This is amazing. Come and look at him. The king has been born. That's this song. Come, joyful and triumphant. Let's come and adore him. There's a, there's a sense of urgency in that song. Imagine someone coming up and grabbing you by the sleeves. Parents, you've probably acknowledged this with your kids or experienced this with your kids. When they see something so great and they grab you and they're going, Dad, come, come. That is this song. Not sure we sing it that way, do we? What is it that, that gets you excited like that? Is there anything in your world that gets you that excited? To be like a little kid like that? Um, we know what Christmas morning is like. And the kids are up super early. And if you're in my house, we're trying to, we were years trying to get the kids to go back to bed. It's not time yet. Right? Uh, but then I do get up and I have to hold them back while I go downstairs and get the, the video camera ready. So that I can get them coming down the stairs. Because I know one of them is going to fall down the stairs. Because their feet are moving so much faster than their head is capable of, right? There's, there's so much that excitement. What is it for you that gets you excited like that? Let's not be underwhelmed by Christmas. Let's not take this great news, this fabulous thing, and, and, and take it for granted or, or downplay it. This, come see this, oh come. All you faithful, joyful and triumphant, come. Because this is world changing. This is world changing. It, it was world changing. 2,500 years ago, if you were here the last couple of weeks, we talked about this. Last week we talked about Isaiah. Uh, 700 years before Jesus. And how in this broken, darkened world, they, they were longing for the rescuer to come. Waiting and waiting, and when he does come, it's world-changing. The excitement would be bubbling over, impossible to put a cork on. That love is world-changing. All of this, all of this generated by, inspired by, catapulted forward by, 
coming alive by love. By love. Now, babies usually come into the world by love somehow. Not this time. This baby came into our world by love, but not because of the love that Mary had for Joseph. If we looked in 1 John chapter 4, Mark read this earlier for us. God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. The coming of Jesus was driven by love. It was driven by love. In John 3.16, he read this as well. For God loved the world so much that he gave his, own, his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. And so Jesus, God himself, came to earth, born as a human baby, just as human as you and me, on God's rescue mission, driven by love. Driven by love. Now, when we read the Christmas story, we usually go to Luke because Luke has the most amount of detail out of any of the Gospels. And Mark doesn't even mention it. But John does in the book of John. Um, but John looks at it completely differently than, than Matthew or, or Luke does. And, 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 and John doesn't give any details of the birth story. He jumps right to the purpose and the reason behind it. In John chapter 1, in John chapter 1, he says, No one, or sorry, the one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming to the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or planning, but a birth that comes from God. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. Folks, that is Christmas. That is Christmas. And look at what it says in verse 14 there. This phrase caught my attention this week as I studied. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And that passage in 1 John was all about love. This passage in John chapter 1 is all about love. In John chapter 3, it was all about love. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. Now, guys, wouldn't it be nice if our wives described our marriage like that? He was full of love, unfailing love and faithfulness. Let's talk about that for a minute. If we're talking about love this morning and we've lit the, the love candle, we've talked about come and adore him, in the context of love, let's talk about marriage for a second. Now, if you've been here for the last two or three years, a couple of years ago, I talked a little bit about the ancient Hebrew marriage ceremony. And uh, I think I referenced it a couple of weeks ago, or uh, maybe a couple of months ago, but didn't make mention of it. But I thought in today, uh, as we talk about love, I wanted to bring this back and walk through this quickly again, depending on time, depending on, depending on how much detail I go into. But 2,000 years ago, in the time of Jesus, uh, the ancient Hebrew wedding courtship process is remarkable. Um, interesting bit of, uh, of history, and if you're not a history buff, don't zone out, because this is very, very cool. 
Uh, whether this, the young man finds his own bride, or most likely it was arranged by the two fathers, uh, the whole thing would be initiated by the groom's father. The groom's father would decide when the time is right for his son. And, and the groom's father would make all of the arrangements. Boy, is that different today, hey? Probably in a wedding, it's the groom's father that has the least to do. But the two fathers then would agree on the price because the, the groom's family would pay a price to the bride's family, and that was, interestingly, both a ransom and also a gift for the bride. When the father uh, figures that it's the right time, and not a day earlier, the father would send his son to the home of the bride. And he would go there and stay there for a while. And, and this very first meeting, this, this very first day, it was official. Although no hanky-panky yet, uh, he would, the father would send his son there. And, and while there, the groom would live at her house get to know her and her family. Uh, he would pay the price that was required. Um, and, and, and when he paid the price, the words that would come out of his mouth are this. That it is paid in full. And then he would present the, her with a covenant. And when the covenant was signed, the words that would come out of his mouth is, it is finished. Does any of this sound familiar? At that point, the betrothal point, uh, period begins. And it could go anywhere from a year to seven years. It was a long waiting period. But they were absolutely considered married. Uh, it was legally binding. And the groom at some point in there, would announce to her and her family that I am going back to my father's house and I will prepare a place for you. Uh, he would go home and begin to construct a house for them attached to the father's house. And over the course of time, uh, that's what he would be doing. So, side note, Mary and Joseph were betrothed and he had gone home, so they were not living in the same house. And they were in this period of waiting when the angel visited both of them. And so it was legally binding as married. And like I said, no hanky-panky yet. But they were in this period of waiting. And so when he finds out she's pregnant, you can see the context there a little bit, right? He, his heart first, as we see in Matthew, is to divorce her quietly. Back to the wedding process. The, the groom leaves and goes back to his father's house. And he prepares a place for his bride. The groom would send a chaperone to be with the bride, to protect her and to guide her and help her be ready. And during that period, one of the things that she would do to become ready would be ceremonially purify herself by immersing herself in the mikvah, in the water, which is baptism. So, the son is preparing, the groom is preparing, and she is preparing. And she would have no idea when he's coming back, other than the fact he said, I will come back, and when I come back, I will get you and take you to where I am, and we'll be together forever. So a time will come sooner or later when the father sees everything is right and he sets that time. He will say to his son, the, son, the hour has come and he will send his son back to go and get the bride. And the groom will actually come following a trumpet blast and steal his bride away. And they will they'll steal away and they will hide in the, 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 the bridal chamber, the place he had prepared for them for seven days. And then following the seven days, there would be the massive wedding feast. There's so much more detail here. 
And all of it overlaps. And, and if you want the sources for that, if you want to Google it, you will find all of this. If you want the sources, there's seven or eight web pages where I've pulled all this together from. I can get that to you on an email this week if you want. But I hope that you can see some parallels here. If you know anything about the New Testament and the life of Christ and the story of, of what Christianity is and what we hope for, then this is an incredible parallel. So look at John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, this is what we read. This is Jesus talking to his followers. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. When everything's ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Does that sound familiar? Everybody would have got that and understand that. And, and, and all of the steps in this marriage ceremony from 2,000 years ago remarkably overlaps and parallels with Jesus. Remarkable. And, 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 and even more so, the Bible paints a picture all the way through of Jesus being the groom and his church, his people being the bridegroom. And in Revelation chapter 19, on the last page of the Bible, we say, let us rejoice and let's be glad and rejoice and let him give honor. Let's give honor to him for the time has come for the wedding feast of the lamb and his bride has prepared herself. This is the whole story, folks. This is, this is his story. This is our story. The first arrival of the groom to her home that's Christmas. That's Christmas. That's, that's, that's what this is. And he has come to the house of the bride to meet, to see, to get to know her, to fall in love, and to fulfill the plan, to give the covenant, to pay the price. And Jesus has done all of that. And we still celebrate his coming to this day, every Christmas. This is his story. This is our story this is Christmas. And, and so we call this, this preparation period in the month of December, we call it Advent. And Advent is, the word just simply is about the, the arrival, the coming, the, the anticipation, the expectation, the hope, the love, like a kid's Advent calendar. Or for some of us, for, ad, for our Advent calendars. Right? It, it, it's the preparation. It's the building the excitement day after day after day as we wait in anticipation, in preparation, because he will return at any moment. All of it, like the wedding, driven by love. And he came full of unfailing love and faithfulness. So this morning... Mark and Ruth read for us and, and, and lit the candle representing love because God loved the world so much that he gave his son. Without that act of love, he does not come in the first place. There's no hope of him coming again. It's like the poor girl Arrangements have been made, and he never shows up. Without love, no one cares, no one tells anybody, nothing happens. Without love, he's not coming back. It's all a cruel joke. Without knowing the love, we walk away because we got tired of waiting. Without love, he never shows up in the first place. Without love, there's no Christmas. This love changes everything. The groom that walked into the bride's house for the very first time changes her life forever. Jesus, born a human, giving himself, showing up here, changes everything. And this is a love that has the power to change your life, to transform your life forever. The promise in Romans chapter 8 
says that nothing can separate us from our love. No matter how ugly it gets or bad it gets or no matter what tragedies come, no matter who tries to block it, nothing can separate us from God's love. This love is life transforming. Every, every moment, the very moment that the groom entered the bride's house, her life changed forever. For Mary, hearing from the angel about what God's plan was and what God was going to do through her, her life changed forever. The shepherds, when the angels broke the sky and told them the news and they ran to see, their lives changed forever. The wise men, as they followed the star and came to see the baby and they worshipped him, their lives changed forever. For Joseph, more of them innocent bystander in the story, when he listened to the angel, he had the option of divorcing her and walking away or taking her as his wife and leaning in. When he made that choice, his life changed forever. Well, what about for you and me? This love is just as life-changing today because of the moment Jesus came into this world. You wonder why we celebrate Christmas? I said the other night at our banquet, I think that the church, I think Christians should be celebrating Christ Christmas so far beyond anyone else. I think our houses should show that. I think we should be showing that. This baby in the manger, the same one is the one who loves you so much. This same baby in the manger is the one who paid the ransom for our freedom. This one, this baby in the manger, as he grew up, he was the one who pledged to you his love and his faithfulness forever. He's the one who has gone on to prepare a place for you, who will come back and bring you to his father's house. This baby in the manger. So, oh, come, let us adore him. Takes me back to the song. Let me wrap this all up, coming back to the song. When we look at the verses of this song, this is basically what it's saying. So, come follow me. Come and see the king is born. Sing. Sing like angels. Get excited. Come and see. And Jesus, Jesus, we greet you. Born this happy morning. Jesus, you get all the attention. You get the glory and praise. Jesus, you are the word of God. Now in flesh appearing right before our eyes. Come, let's go. Love, love, love. What an expression of love. So come, let's come, and let's go and adore him, Christ the Lord. You want to know what this song says? What we're singing when we sing it? It says, come on, follow me. You got to see this for yourself. The king is here, and he wants to meet you. He's come full of unfailing love and faithfulness. So where are you in this process? Because this song, each of the verses calls us to action, to respond. It says that we need to come, and we need to assemble, and we need to be present, and we need to draw near, and we need to adore. So do I need to ask you to come? Like a kid tugging on your sleeve, you got to see this, come see this. Uh, do I need to challenge you to assemble, to get together, to gather? We need to journey through this together, not alone, as we wait for his arrival. Maybe we need to be challenged to really be present. Because... Um, I think there's an awful lot of people that believe but aren't waiting very well, who are not really present and active in this. The bride needs to be ready and waiting and prepared because he's coming back when they don't know at any time. Maybe, this, the, maybe the challenge today is to simply draw near, to lean in. The bridegroom is coming. He's coming. It's time to lean in. 
Love is the catalyst for God's rescue plan for the world. Love is the catalyst for God's rescue plan for the world. And love has arrived and was swaddled in a manger. Pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for your love. That long before the creation of this world, your plan was drawn up and ready and you were waiting for the right moment. That because of your love, you sent your son. Because of your love, the betrothal period began. Because of your love, he is preparing a place for us. Because of your love, he will return and take us to be with him. Because of your love, he paid the price in full to free us from sin and from separation so that we might know you all because of love. Your love is both a ransom and a gift. God, as we get closer and closer to Christmas and our anticipation builds, God, would you build our excitement for the coming of the Savior? In Jesus' name.